so I've been vegan for about four and a half years now. I am vegan, yes. I'm vegan most of the time. I think the motivation for me personally, I think it stemmed a lot from uh, the, the animal side of it, like the, the welfare side of it, of the animals, the fact that it has become more of a factory farming kind of thing now. I mean, obviously there are things which I've avoided, so for example, you know, if you're going to buy shoes, uh, you know, looking at, to make sure there's not uh, like leather and stuff like that. It's pretty grim, to be honest. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't like the thought of animals powering my house. I had never thought of that as a concept, to be honest with you. Um, so yeah, when you when you told me about it, I did a little bit of research. I was actually I was very surprised. I think if I had been aware of that previously, yeah, it would have would have made me feel more comfortable. Yeah. I think I think yeah, the word green, I think is is not misleading, but it's kind of a yeah, it can be misconstrued definitely. Um, to say green energy, you do think oh, it's you know eco friendly and. Uh, it's not, you know, it doesn't necessarily harm anything in any way. Like I said, this is the first I've heard of animals being used to, for power purposes. Um, so yeah, I think now that I, kn I knew about it, it definitely would. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Yeah, it would. Yeah. It definitely, it rang a couple of bells. It opened like a little, a little tab in the back of my brain and sort of pinned that for later, like as and when, you know, I can sort of go and look into actually possibly making and making and making a change. Ah, well, evening everybody and uh, welcome to the latest in our Wednesday night Facebook live events. I hadn't seen that video before actually, so I found that a little bit interesting and then I realized uh, from the ending uh, title that it was one of ours. So um, there we go, there's me catching up. So I'm joined tonight by a good friend, uh, somebody I've known for a long time, Juliet from Viva. Um, evening, Juliet. Good evening. <laughs> How are you doing? Cool. I mean, yeah, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, uh, you know, busy as usual. Uh, do you want to just kick off with a with a quick sentence or two to uh, tell everybody what Viva does? Because you could do it better than I can do, I think. Oh, sure. Yeah, Viva, I founded 26 years ago. Um, when I first founded it, my passion was very much about stopping animal cruelty. Um, as Viva has evolved, and uh, I suppose my interests have evolved as well, we're very much involved in Viva Planet and Viva Health. So we have four sections with those and Viva Animals and Viva Lifestyle. So we literally look at the three main issues of why going vegan is imperative um, for the future of planet Earth. And also we help people change. So quite a big job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you uh, you you made some uh, some good films. I'm thinking of Hogwood in particular, but uh, beyond the films, have done some amazing investigations, uh, and you broke stories into the mainstream media, and you've caused supermarkets to actually drop some of the most abusive factory farm suppliers and stuff like that uh, recently. Yeah, in fact, over our um, 26 years, one of our I suppose our fortes has been investigating inside factory farms because obviously nobody wants to see really what's going on you don't you know it's very uncomfortable thinking that animals are kept cruelly because in our heart of hearts we all know that it's wrong um, and, and it's obscene so somebody exposing it can make people feel very uncomfortable and going to see it yourself obviously you know you're being confronted with stuff that really upsets you um, and so what we did each time we went into a factory farm, we tried to investigate the chain of supply um, and then expose the supermarket. Because ultimately they are, you know, very responsible for what happens inside those farms. So you just mentioned Hogwood. Well, Hogwood was a big case for us because we found out from the neighbours of the farmer, actually, they said, oh, by the way, they, they supply Tesco. Um, oh, by the way, go and look at the woods one mile down the road because it's littered with a graveyard of these pigs that they've dumped. And so clearly the guy running this place wasn't very popular in his own village. And the place itself was one of the worst that we'd ever investigated. And we found out that they supplied Tesco. But I think this is what I'm kind of getting to is the British public think that when you expose cruelty, that something will be done about it. You can just call the RSPCA or you can call a vet or the government, but somebody's bound to do something about it because it's civilized United Kingdom. And we obviously, as we always do, we called every authority that you possibly can, including trading standards 
and the ones I've just mentioned, and they were investigated. And Tesco actually, to my surprise, dug their heels in and said, um, no, we've investigated and what we see is not the same as your footage. Um, we're going to allow them to continue supplying. So the guy running the place um, spent tens and tens of thousands of pounds upping the security rather than improving the actual lot for the animals, um, making it harder for us to go back in and investigate, but we did. We got back in um, and the film sort of shows how the story of doing that and how difficult it is. And in that case, we had to stop the investigation because pigs were being cannibalized live in front of us. And we just couldn't justify just holding a camera and not doing anything. So we stopped, we called the police, <laughs> we called vets. Um, Tesco still wouldn't stop the supply. So we went back again in 2019, only this time the crucial difference was we left hidden cameras. Um, and what they showed were actually the men hitting the animals. When you show human beings interacting with animals in that way, supermarkets simply at that point can't justify themselves from a PR perspective. But the sad thing was, I have to say, because I know some people behind the scenes, you know, when you're dealing with the big guys in places like that, it, it, there's very, you would think that they're just normal human beings and they'd be moved by what we what we had filmed. But instead, it was very defensive in this case. And um, what they actually said, I heard from behind the scenes, was that if we stop Hogwood, then Viva have kind of won this major victory and all that will happen is that they will investigate the next farm because basically pig farming in the UK is such low standards. And we as a supermarket then start to have to face up to the fact that pig farming standards are really, really low and do something about it. And, and apparently that's what I was told from somebody very high up um, who, who was part of these conversations um, was the reason they didn't want to do it because of the domino effect. But in fact, because the footage was so bad, they did drop Hogwood and it got huge publicity. We made the documentary Hogwood, a modern horror movie. And, um, you know, and it's won all kinds of awards, which is very nice. But the main thing is, is the, the response from members of the public who just your bog standard meat consumer who just cannot believe that that is a it is not an aberrant farm. That is how pigs are farmed in the UK. And it, and it is shocking. Yeah, good. I mean, you mentioned a couple of things there that I think are really interesting. One, one is the cognitive dissonance that exists in our country. You know, we're a nation of animal lovers and we go to all kinds of lengths to avoid suffering for pets, for example. But when it comes to farm animals, it's completely different. And it is very much out of sight, out of mind. And also, we're told all of the time by the animal food lobby that Britain has some of the highest welfare standards in the world. It's a line that they repeat ad nauseum. Uh, and yet, as you say, you know, the standards of, of pig welfare, you know, I mean, they are abysmal and supermarkets don't want to admit to that. I get that. Uh, coming back to the video briefly, it reminds me that I think it was a couple of years ago now that we, uh, we kind of broke the story that animals were finding their way into people's electricity and gas, which was mm. a shock at the time uh, to, to all of us, I think. Mm. <laughs> and obviously a bit of a shock to the people in that video. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, it's I, I just um, I mean, it's amazing what Ecotricity have done from so many fronts. And by the way, I have read your book, <laughs> not just the not just the chapter manifesto, the whole thing. I really enjoyed it, by the way, Dale. It was it was oh, a really cool. good insight. There's a couple of things I'd really like to ask you about, actually. But um, anyway, um, yeah, it Go is ahead. it's really shocking yeah. in terms of where animal parts turn up. But you can imagine an industry that's killing over a billion land animals, let alone the fish and the shellfish on top of that. And, you know, there's all kinds of things that they're doing with those parts. I just got a press release today from a company that's made chewing gum, um, you know, without plastic, for example. I mean, did we know, did, did we know that chewing gum contained plastic? You know, they, they, it, I think basically the world is changing. You know, things are forging ahead and people are starting to wake up. And there are all kinds of reasons for that, not least the fact that the issues themselves very sadly are becoming more urgent by the day and people especially young people it's kind of like what legacy are we handing on to them and and them actually saying that to us with people like Greta but many many others too um forcing you know our generation really to actually face up to you know to what's happening to the world and do something about it and there are other reasons like um you know obviously social media from our perspective 
in 2000, I think it's 2015, for the first time, I think in Britain anyway, I actually talked to camera about the farm that I was filming because normally what we've done over all the years and what other groups have done, you get in, you film and you get the hell out. Um, you don't stand around talking to camera and making a film about it. And I did, I did it with pigs and I did it with actually caged hens, the enrichment cages, so-called, the, the hens that are kept for eggs. Um, and it was so shocking and so sad. And I talked to camera so you can explain what you're seeing in front of you. But also, I think the difference was it legitimized people's emotions. So somebody who perhaps, uh, you know, is consuming those animals, the eggs or the meat or the dairy, you know, maybe feeling uncomfortable, but having somebody say, look, it's OK to care about this. This is a normal human reaction. And it just went absolutely wild um, for the first time. You know, we used to have investigations having thousands and then through traditional media, millions of people looking at it, but not through social media. And suddenly we were whoosh into the millions through social media, which the point I'm getting to is social media has given us this platform that's relatively cheap. And pre that, we just couldn't afford to pay the prices the meat industry was paying for advertising. And so that really changed the boundaries. We just went into investigations more and more and more because more and more people were seeing them and facing up to what we were doing. And like the work that you've done with Ecotricity, you know, to, in terms of talking about, you know, with environmental groups, the, 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 um, the worry in terms of destroying the earth, basically in terms of loss of biodiversity and global warming, but also you're giving the solutions. And that's something that Viva is turning to next. Actually, we're setting up another section, Dale, called Viva Farming, actually. Uh, and it's all about transitioning. And that's a whole interesting bag in its own right as well. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. I mean, you, you touch on something there that I agree with very much, that the, the rise of the internet and of social media have helped us massively uh, in the environment cause and the animal cause is part of that as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think it's the availability of information that we've, we've never had. It's at, at an unprecedented level, you know, this stuff just can't be hidden. And when people see this stuff, it, it bothers them. You know, you were reminding me just now of, of, of one example for me, at Forest Green, <clears throat> we took the club vegan over about three seasons. And the last thing we did was to take cow's milk off the menu. And I remember chatting to people in the main suite there when we did that, they came in and they were like, oh, we can't have milk now, <laughs> which is really funny. And, um, and, was, and a couple of guys, I said to me what's wrong with milk so i told them how milk was made and they looked at me like you can't be serious <laughs> yeah. and, well, and, you know and when, sorry no, just well, when, they, when, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when they when they took that on board that was it they, they were fine you know they tried the alternatives oat was the one that everybody adopted the most and, and right. that's you know that's history now yeah i was just going to say it's only very recently we did a survey with one poll of two thousand adults across all age groups and it was kind of shocking that over 60% had no idea a cow was made pregnant and gave birth to produce milk. And it, it, when you actually say that out loud, it seems so ridiculous because of course all mammals have to give birth to produce milk. And yet that, you know, that what you just said before, the cognitive dis dissonance, somehow we treat farmed animals if there is a completely separate entity and even cows miraculously produce milk just because they eat grass. And, you know, that whole process in between, because our kids are not taught that at primary school when they're taught about everything to do with that stuff. You know, conveniently, the dairy industry, which really goes for primary school, if you look at the stuff that they produce, there's not a single mention about a cow being pregnant or her giving birth to a calf and then her milk's produced. And, and that's how you get your milk, because you're drinking, you know, the milk that was meant for that baby. So these things are brushed aside. And. I, I get very passionate about it. I start before Viva. I worked on youth education for several years, actually, on these issues. And in fact, they're my favorite group to work with, which is, I'd say, like about 13 to 18 year olds, because they're old enough to really think things through themselves. And they're still so passionate about the issues. You know, things are relatively simple the way that they should be. Cruelty is cruelty and cruelty is cruelty. We should just all care. And, um, you know, when you think in terms of if uh, basically, if the truth was taught in schools from age four up and all food was vegan, how fast we would transform the whole world, you know, within a generation, um, you know, because children, they want to do the best thing. 
Yeah, no, agreed. And, you know, it's one of my favorite parts of the whole eco puzzle that um, if we all go plant based, we free up 75% of all farmland in Britain, which is 75% of all land in Britain. So it's like half of our entire country. Uh, you mentioned a minute ago that you're starting a farming section for transition. And it strikes me that the transition from farming to a large extent is is into rewilding. There are other transitions as well, such as green gas, where we can create 70,000 jobs and we can make our own gas just from grass and stuff like that. But uh, I love the fact that just changing our diets can have such an, a transformative effect on our country, uh, our countryside and our experience really of, of life. And and it shouldn't be surprising because actually the, the big drivers of the climate crisis, the wildlife and nature crisis and all that kind of stuff are two things, burning fossil fuels and eating animals. Mm. And if we stop doing both of them, we unwind all of these multiple crises. So, I mean, that's what I like about the whole thing. And it sounds, you know, you say it out loud, it, it's it's so simple even though there's a lot to unwind there and unravel. <laughs> but yeah. it is, you know, at least one of the reasons that I set up Viva um, was because back then there was nobody actually campaigning on vegan issues as, as in actively campaigning. Um, so obviously that was one reason, but the other was because I, I found it such an empowering thing to do. Because if you can just persuade people that this is, you know, just the simple truth, and to, and to change things, you just need to change yourself and the power is within your wallet. And I love the fact, see, previously to that, I'd worked for an anti-vivisection organisation and almost everything you did with that group, it had to be changed through politics. And it's such a slow, tedious process. Whereas this, you know, you just walk into a supermarket or wherever and you choose. And that is so empowering and to have, you know, through all these years, the number of people have contacted Viva and said, it's you, you know, it's you that put me on that pathway. It's, you know, it's Viva that made me go vegan. It's just incredible. And and, it, and when you think about one of the campaigns we ran at Viva was called Face Off. And that was to say, look, when you do a campaign like Hogwood, um, recently there's another one um, called Flat House Pig Farm in Leicestershire, which um, if anything is even worse than Hogwood. And you know, we handed over all the footage to Trading Standards and they handed back the footage and they hadn't even opened the films. And yet, in fact, you yourself, Dale, you saw some of that footage and you said, how can this possibly, possibly be allowed to continue? And, and it is, it is gobsmacking how bad that place is and it is allowed to continue because I walked in there and, you know, we were filming animals dying in front of me. It's horrendous. And um, you think in terms of that, that, um, that, things would be simpler to change so what we say to people the government aren't going to do it you know we've been asking them to do this for 26 years and um, they tiddle around the edges but they defend it ultimately but you can change yourself the responsibility ultimately does lie with us as individuals and you know you can't keep shifting the blame onto somebody else and want somebody else to make that change for you um at least with veganism you can make that change yourself yeah, I'm a big believer in that. You know, our work is about energy, transport and food, the kind of uh, big three issues driving all of the crises. And uh, we like to say to people, it's about how you power your home, how you travel and what you eat. And you make decisions every day in those three areas of life. And if you, you know, if you start making better decisions, greener decisions in each and any one of those, then you start down this path. And actually, businesses pick those signals up. I mean, the, the massive rise in the availability of vegan products of the last year or two has been fueled by the the uptake and and it's a kind of virtuous circle a positive feedback loop you know there's more stuff available it's in greg's it's in mcdonald's more people see it more people buy it and businesses go oh, we better make more of this stuff because yes. people want it you know and, and away it goes like a great big snowball can't be stopped now absolutely and if you look if you get the meat industry news um sort of how they're talking behind the scenes <laughs> I don't it's, get that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's really interesting it's got huge parallels to the the field that you work in um i'm sure you remember um when greenpeace um uh, sort of openly infiltrated one of the big meetings and they talked i think it was bp i don't know if you remember and and they made public the 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 um the transcript basically from the meeting where bp were basically saying the reason that we don't go over to you know to to, to um renewable sources of energy right now is because we're waiting to the for the point that it gets so bad that the government basically subsidize and give us loads of money to do it 
And exactly the same, it was exactly the same that the meat industry were saying this. They were saying, we're waiting for, we know that we're, the, they didn't use these words, but basically they know we're screwing the environment um, and, and things have got to change, but we want more help and we're going to wait till things get worse. And I just thought, wow, what an attitude. You think they'd want to be at the forefront of, you know, of the change, you know, but in fact, instead they're resisting it, resisting it, resisting it. Until until it's a breaking point, you kind of think, well, have you got kids and grandkids, and do you actually care about this planet at all? No. If I mean, people that can do that for money don't care about anything. Mm. It's. I mean, you know, to treat animals like that for money, mm. then I mean, what do they care about except money? So I'd, I'm I'm not surprised that they're waiting for the money to land to help them change what they do that's not surprising to me mm. because, i thought it was uh, sad what you said um about elon musk in terms of i'd forgotten that i remember i'd read it in the papers but in your book manifesto that bit about tesla and their oh my god their ruthlessness in terms of the um what's it called the electric highway yeah, um yeah. i thought that was an astonishing the way that they try to, you know, screw you into the ground over that and um, was, it was awful. It was incredible. It was, it, was, it, was, <laughs> it was surreal at the time. When we read that that email that broke the story, the one they sent to us accidentally, <laughs> we thought it was a dark joke. <laughs> we realised it was real and it was a mistake. We weren't meant to be reading it. But, and well, you, you kind of hope that a company like that has, you know, sort of operates in a better manner. And it is, it, it's a little bit more shocking when it's something that you hope it has more morals to it, which clearly they don't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess when a company or a person masquerades as, as you know, having an eco conscience or being green, which is what Musk does, then, then yeah, you, you expect better. Uh, but. But, you know, I think uh, yeah, there's plenty of evidence, isn't there, of, of, of the way employees are treated at Tesla, for example. I mean, there's plenty of evidence of what really drives him. And it, it's not the environment. He's not on a mission to save the world at all. Uh, but let's not talk about him because, you know, <laughs> that's no fun. Um, I think Will's going to jump in in a minute with some questions. But uh, did you say there was a book question that you wanted to ask? Or should we just move oh, on? Oh, no, to... I, th I was. It was, um, it was that. I was just, it was just what I thought was really striking. Um, Apart from the Battle of Beanfield at the start, which yeah. was wow, yeah, that sort of memories from you know from the past in Thatcher's era and all that. Oh my God, do you ever think like to, this is completely changing the subject? Do you ever think that today things have genuinely changed and that you know that the police force has changed, or do you think that it's just sort of like a thin slice away from being able to go back to those times? Well, you know, I think things have changed. I was emailing um, John Gummer today, and I don't know if you remember him, but he's from the same era. He was environment secretary in the mad cow disease I do remember. era. Yeah, well, look, he's chairman of the Climate Change Committee now. He's a really good guy, uh, completely on board. And I was emailing him about uh, writing an op-ed for The Express. That we're running a Green Britain campaign with them, which again is a little bit uh, surprising. And I think a sign of how things have changed because uh, you know, the Express turned their masthead green. I don't know if you've seen it, uh, called for, you know, people to join the campaign for a green Britain. The Sun saw it and liked it and copied it. And now we've got the Sun and the Express vying for green cred all in the space of just two weeks. Uh, but yeah, I think things can change because here's a figure from the Thatcher era, John Gummer, you know, and he's yes. head of the Climate Change Committee of the government. And, and we're friends uh, talking about the same stuff and really on the same page. That is brilliant. I remember, I mean, a lot of people watching this will be too young to remember, but um, he basically was criticised for practically force feeding his four-year-old daughter beef when BSC and he was saying BSC is safe from Professor Richard Lacey who actually helped Viva so I remember Professor Richard Lacey so well he was this guy who was one of the very few academics who said it may not be safe and in fact BSC may well jump to human beings and he the actual in parliament they said who the hell is this guy they tried to make him out to be a complete nutcase and they said, has he had anything published? I'll never forget it, because in Hansard, they had to publish what he'd published. And he'd published about 300 different scientific papers. Yes, wow. he, yes, this guy <laughs> knows what he's talking about. But he was really shocked. I, find, I felt dreadfully sorry for him, because it was the power of what the government can do to an academic. Um, and they really, really sidelined him and tried to make him out to be a nutcase. And in fact, of course, what he said was absolutely right. It was him, Professor Richard Lacey, and his guy that worked with him, Dr. Stephen Dealer. They're the only two brave enough to say BSE could pass to human beings. Um, yeah, yeah, and uh, 
Mad cow disease is, is a great example of the depths of depravity to which the animal farming industry will sink if allowed, isn't it? Feeding animal bodies to other grazing animals. And, and you know, hey, what a big surprise it created some, some hideous disease uh, that did jump to humans, as you say. But, <clears throat> uh, you know, I think the, the intensive animal farming industry is, uh, is just an incredibly abusive, disgraceful thing that we, we shouldn't allow to exist in, in this 21st century. We really shouldn't. No, so that's my view. No, Q angry farmers no. in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, the major campaign we're running now is end factory farming before it ends us. But because obviously, with the pandemic, of course, there are many other things that are, you know come to the public eye. I mean, people have been warning, as you know, against pandemics and said that there's that link with factory farming for decades, actually. Um, mm. But obviously, um, it's not just that; it's antibiotic resistance. There's so many issues feeding into this that factory farming is so dangerous and so damaging and so cruel. Um, it just, it really does have to go. And this first um, massive phase of transitioning, factory farming has to be the first thing that goes. And we need intergovernmental cooperation, unfortunately, because <laughs> I'd rather not have to have that. But um, and we do, we actually need government support now um, on an international level. I do, part of me does feel really optimistic and excited because I think we're getting to a point where um change is really going to happen and i think once it starts to happen it's going to be very fast indeed yeah i agree i agree i, I think uh you know as it says in chapter 13 of my book we have everything that we need we have the technology we just need to change behavior it's actually more economic to make these changes than it is not to you know there's there's a kind of stupid economy uh, in what we're doing at the moment mm -hmm. we spend 50 billion pounds a year burning fossil fuels that we buy from abroad but we have enough wind and sun to make all of that energy ourselves not just saving the pollution saving the cash leaving our economy creating jobs here that kind of stuff and we spend two billion a year subsidizing factory farms that are poisoning mm. the water, you know, poisoning yeah. people's bodies and abusing animals. And um, and so one of the things uh, that I really call for in that, is, you know, I mean, people, business and the government are the three uh, parts of our society that, that need to act. I think people are getting it and they are choosing different things. Yeah. Business see that and they are making different things available. And I think it's government that have fallen behind and that we need the most. Mm -hmm. And they have these three big levers of taxes, subsidies and regulations. And if they change the uh, the tax system to take off the the brakes of the green economy. So, for example, we pay 20 percent VAT for solar panels at home or 5 percent to burn coal, which is crazy. If they, if they change that and, and we launched a campaign last week with the Daily Express, my new friends, which seems so crazy <laughs> to say, but it's true, uh, calling on the chancellor to take the chance of leaving uh, the EU Brexit uh, because it, because in the past the government said we can't change VAT because we're part of Europe, you know, it's one of those things it does uh, no longer. So we've said, uh, let's have a Brexit boost for the green economy and flat rate, uh, zero rate rather, VAT for all the things that help us get to zero carbon. And government can go further than that, you know, like there's um, 12 billion subsidies at the moment for renewable energy, uh, sorry, for <laughs> fossil fuels mm -hmm. and about 8 billion for renewable energy, you know. So over just five or six years, we could take 2 billion a year and dump it from one pot to the other. It won't cost any more money, but we can remove the support for fossil fuels and grow the support for renewable energy. Same with factory farming, um, same with electrification of transport. Uh, you know, I mean, everything we need to do is not just available to us. It's, it's going to be much cheaper and better for us to do it. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm super positive that uh, it's going to happen. Yeah, and I thought what was interesting, you mentioned in the book, um, in terms of gas, being able to use the infrastructure to go over to green grass, green grass, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, green, green, grass. green gas from grass. <laughs> um, and you mentioned there's just one line in there where my ears picked up in terms of being able to make fertilizer for um, plant based, um, you know, crops of veganic farming in other words which is obviously what we're interested in because we need to get away from the reliance on using animal manure um it, you know in arable farming so i thought that that was interesting because the, the whole two things it's like they go hand in hand you know together yeah well, a green gas mill where we would make this gas we're, we're going to build the first one this year uh is like a it's like an industrial cow uh, or cow stomach you know we feed silage actually into that and we it breaks down anaerobically <clears throat> and it produces methane to put into the gas grid but the byproduct is like cow poo it's oh. it's fertilizer it's, so That's it's just true. like a cow except it doesn't leak and it doesn't get 
you know, treated cruelly. Um, and, and it doesn't have all of the climate impacts and all that kind of stuff. You know, the gas we make uh, is climate neutral. Um, I think something like 12 million hectares of, of land would become organic and wildlife havens, just greater mode twice a year. And we create 70,000 jobs in the rural economy and save the burning of about seven billion pounds worth of, of gas every year. And obviously the emissions that go with it. I mean, it's incredible. But there's enough marginal land in Britain for everybody that's listening that doesn't know this. To, we can grow enough grass to make enough gas to power all of Britain's 26 million homes. We don't have to give up gas to fight the climate crisis. We just got to make our own from grass, which I mm -hmm. love. Yeah, and I think fundamentally for the British public, probably people listening to this may be less so, but the British public still don't understand the inefficiency of animal agriculture. Um, it's a little bit harder to explain. Factory farming is easy to grasp, isn't it? It's cruel, it's wrong. They can't, you know, anyone can get that. But with the inefficiency argument, in terms of, you know, like you just said before, the amount of land that's wasted across the UK in terms of people need to understand that so much of our arable land is used to grow fodder to feed to farmed animals and that's an incredibly wasteful way of feeding us and as the human population grows across the planet um the, the planet simply can't sustain it because what we're doing is we're destroying every last wilderness to grow fodder and when we come back to britain um obviously quite rightly we're concerned about the amazon but it's shocking when you think that we've destroyed our own natural woodlands faster than the amazon is being destroyed and we're left with these tiny little pockets um, and so what we're talking about in terms of this, you know, going future, uh, going forward for the future in terms of getting rid of fossil fuels and getting rid of animal agriculture is freeing up so much land, rewilding it, you know, planting trees so that they can absorb carbon out of the atmosphere, but also so that we can support wildlife again. Um, and uh, the scary thing, of course, for farmers is that this means change. It's all very positive change, ultimately, and it has to happen. But of course, individuals who you know been farming for years, or and that's all they know, it's persuading people like that to work with us instead of see us as the enemy. And obviously, we need farmers because you know, at the end of the day, they're the ones feeding us. It's just we want the things done in such a different, different way. But people, you know, you talk about you know, like you just said about creating jobs. People forget. The vast majority of animals in the UK, it's, it's almost 90%, the vast majority of animals are factory or intensively farmed. And of course, when intensive farming was developed, people were just thrown out of farming work left, right and centre, because of course, you know, how many people do you need to so-called look after tens and tens of thousands of animals, you know, squashed together in a shed? And basically your job is picking out the dead, you know, and so, and so it employs relatively few people so what we're talking about is a way of farming that employs more people that's kinder to the land diversifying the land so you're doing much more with it um and making britain a much more exciting and beautiful landscape as well yes agreed we launched a campaign this week uh, in the express second week of our campaign about exactly that rewilding britain making the point that you know we wring our hands about the amazon over here in the west and and we seem to uh, not not be cognizant of the fact that we've we've wiped out our own Amazon, you know, our own natural wildlife, and, and lost so much uh, over the last uh, what, fifty to one hundred years, probably. But you know, our, our ancient forests have all but gone. HS two is blasting, uh, you know, some of the last of those uh, to make way for that. And um, in the last fifty years, we've lost more than half of our birds. Uh, you know, our insects, beavers are gone. I know people are trying to bring them back, but, but you know, Britain has become a wildlife desert, and and it's not just because of the lowlands where we're growing crops to feed animals, but the uplands as well. So we put a little video out on um, on Facebook in the last few days to support this campaign, and we went back to a piece of land that we we rewilded about 20 years ago and it's a wilderness uh, it's a small wilderness but it's still mm. wild and i love it and the kinds of responses we got back on social media are really interesting there's a guy in particular on twitter he's a farmer he made a little video response i saw today i, I will get around to responding but he's up on his hillside saying look you know this is a this is a great habitat my sheep live here it's rough land you can't do anything with it and i think it's one of the big mistakes of the of the animal uh, uh, farming industry and actually meat eaters that want to cling on to that way of life. They say, we can't do anything else with that land. We, we, we have to graze it. And I say, absolutely not. We don't have to do anything with that land. And that is not habitat. That's a desert for wildlife. And, and if we let it go, if we take the grazing off our uplands, then we can bring back uh, wildlife, you know, that we used to have here. Uh, so it's a really interesting debate. 
And they also overlook the fact that 90%, as you say, of all uh, meat uh, made in Britain is, is factory farmed. You know, the, the guy making his video says, well, I've been farming it for 300 years and this is regenerative agriculture and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I'm sure he's not wrong, but but he he's this part of the industry and, and the bulk of the industry is doing something else far more damaging. But even his little part of the industry, we don't need. And actually, we've taken all of that land from nature. And we can have such a different country, you know, with pine martens and red squirrels and, mm -hmm. and badgers and beavers and all sorts of stuff uh if we if we just change and we we do need to fundamentally shift our attitude in terms of our place in the world i mean you think we kind of learn our lesson by now and obviously people are changing but uh, it really saddens me i live near um where um wild boar have managed to you know repopulate parts of the forest of dean and they're actually quite they're probably only about a mile from where i i live now which is south of there um and um, and the attitude and the controversy that that creates the fact that wild, a wild mammal has tried to trying its damnedest you know to repopulate these small pockets of woodlands um and you think of our record with the badger you know recent years it, it it's it's just frighteningly appalling in the uk um and you think part of that problem is because we haven't got the you know the land to rewild at the moment and part of the solution of course so that we can live in harmony with wildlife is getting rid of animal agriculture of course so that we have the land to give back to these animals and 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 accept that we're not the you know we're not the center of the universe and the only important species um but yeah it, it, right. the, the, the arguments between people over you know like the wild boar you know can get quite um quite upsetting sometimes in terms of you see these attitudes that seem so um, decades out of date. <laughs> my, my, my favorite retort, actually, in, in online debates about this is when somebody, and there's always at least one person will say it, says, well, what's going to happen to all of the millions of animals if we all go vegan overnight? You're going to have to, like, kill them and make them extinct as if for, for one thing they were wild species and, and natural to our country uh, or for another that it would happen overnight anyway or that they don't really realize that those animals are getting killed anyway uh, because yeah. that's part and parcel of, of their diet so that always makes me laugh i've got a little message here from will saying he's got loads of questions so yeah. we should probably give the floor over to um to that i think here he comes good, e good evening to you both from Hi. one animal in a shed producing methane to another. So, um, <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> from people. There's a great deal of love for you both from the audience, which is wonderful. We're going to start there. I also want to say hello and good evening to all the beef farmers in the audience tonight, because we've definitely got a few of those in expressing their views on why uh, their way of life is their way of life. And um, lots of really, really interesting questions for you both. So we're going to fire through as many of these as we can. Um, I am going to start with this one. Uh, what do both of you think of artificially created meat products, this stuff like 3D printed beef? Um, th there's, I mean, obviously lab meat is um, potentially a huge business that's um, being invested in more and more heavily. Um, there's a British billionaire that's um, starting to invest in it in the UK. Um, and my thoughts are that even though it's not a vegan product, and obviously I'm representing Viva, it could potentially save millions and if not billions of animals. And if meat eaters are not prepared to go across to the very good plant based alternatives, which are getting better and better all the time, and and it takes the McDonald's of this of this world to you know to sell the lab based meat to save those animals and to protect the planet and also reduce things like antibiotic resistance issues, then that's obviously a very positive thing. I do think what will happen is lab meat becomes you know cheap and available. That also the plant based alternatives will also come into the fore. And so that lab cultured meat will not be needed so much because you can just make so many fantastic things using plants. And the other thing that's coming to the fore, um, which an organisation in Scotland, I've been discussing um, um, stuff about this with, is, is using protein from actually fungi um, and algae and so forth that, that is incredibly adaptable. and You can make it taste like pretty much anything you want. 
So um, in terms of my viewpoint, I, I'm all for getting anything that makes a meat eater transition um, away from consuming real animals. Um, I'm very pragmatic about it. Yeah, and I am as well. I mean, personally, they do nothing for me because obviously I'm not interested in eating animals. And, and so I've got no interest in products that fake animals, whether it's meat grown in a lab in a Petri dish or, or whether it's plants being kind of uh, manipulated to, to mimic the meat experience, <clears throat> like uh, you know, moving mountains or something like that plant burgers that bleed i mean you know uh, i don't get that at all but that's me personally and you know and it applies to a lot of other people as well who don't want that don't need that but there's a bigger audience of people that that perhaps do need that to start them on the path and so you know i'm fine like you know carry on if it's not intensively uh, farmed in the way that animals are at the moment then it has to be better and if it's better then you know then i'm for it Here's one from Jackie Jones, and she says, could funding be made available to make TV commercials to promote veganism and the reality of commercial farming? I guess you've seen the one running in Israel at the moment. I haven't, but I don't know if you've reviewed it. You have? Yeah, I have seen it. It's, re it's really good. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> could funding be made available? <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're very willing to make those television commercials and place them if somebody wants to fund them. <laughs> well, it's funny, isn't it? Because uh, just recently um, we we sent a complaint to the ASA about um, some animal industry uh, advertising, lobbying. Uh, this is the B12 campaign, wasn't it? Saying yeah. that if you're a vegan, then you're missing B12. Turns out that that's funded by DEFRA. Uh, and I know that, you know, thousands of other people have also complained to the ASA off the back of that. So, I mean, the answer is like, wouldn't it be great to have funding to promote a, a vegan diet and a better way to live? But actually, at the moment, funding is doing the opposite. Your uh, good friend, Gareth Wynne Jones, the farmer, Dale, has said hello. He's watching on Twitter. Nice one. Nice one. I, I like the video today, Gareth. I saw it. I thought it was really, really cool. And, you know, I get what you're saying. I'm going to make you a little video back and, and uh, you know, and post it because, uh, you know, it deserves an answer. Uh, here's a nice one. Uh, it says, Steve, Juliet, you're my hero. Oh, oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> this conversation, Dale, you can be mine. Um, the, uh, here's one for you. Phil Joyce says, how on earth are we going to close down the mega farms in America? Uh, I, I think, think it'll I just happen. Yeah, it'll, it'll, yeah, no, go ahead. yeah, it'll just happen. You know, this is the direction of travel of the world now, and it won't happen as quickly as perhaps me and Juliet want it to happen and other people, but it's happening, and, and I don't think it's stoppable. Mm. Absolutely. I think, I think um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard, but um, on the Hogwood video, Joseph Poor um, was one of the uh, people interviewed on it, and he is a really important guy because he's at Oxford University and ran one of the most well-respected studies in the entire in the entire world because it was so huge looking at the impact of all kinds of farming um on the planet and it's so um definitively said basically animal agriculture is damaging the planet in terms of the percentage of global warming gases it produces in terms of biodiversity loss eutrophication of waterways and um, air pollution and so it just went on and on and on um, the, the, the impact of meat is so huge and um, so staggering, so colossal, that there is only one way that we can go, which is to get rid of animal agriculture. And of course, the industry at the moment is, like I said, they're starting to face up to that. They know the damage that they're doing and they're deciding which way to go. Now, some of the clever ones, like um, a big burger company in Holland, have now invested in vegan burgers, for example. So the clever ones are getting with it and switching over. But, you know, it's going to be a big fight, just as it is with fossil fuels. You know, it, it's these, these guys go down fighting, unfortunately. But they will go down. That's the important bit. <laughs> One here from Michael Hawkins. We need a meat and dairy tax, subsidised food with a low carbon footprint, fruit and veg. Yeah, I agree. And, and it's one of the perversities of our current tax system. One of the things we flagged to Rishi in the letter last week is that beef has got no VAT and nuts has VAT, you know. Uh, the taxes are in the wrong place and we need to just take tax off of low carbon stuff and put tax onto high carbon stuff. It's a very simple thing to do and it will change behavior at the moment. It's perverse because we make the damaging things cheaper and the less damaging things more expensive is just perverse.
Yeah, and I think I think we forget that. I mean, you just talked about billions being um, spent on factory farming, which is outrageous. But on top of that, other forms of animal agriculture, so um, so-called free-range farming, um, the subsidies for that, are, are, you know, have always been huge. You know, if you look at Scotland, the average business makes a loss; it's completely uneconomic. You know, in England, um, I think sixty-two percent of the farm income comes from subsidies. So, you know, there's been this attitude from government that the farmer is, you know, like um, a species that has to be maintained no matter what. Well, what. What we're saying is, yeah, we want food, but we want it to be done in a sustainable, economic way. Um, it's just like um, Dale's book, Manifesto. When you read it, you just think everything that we're saying is such common sense. You know, imagine coming down from another planet and looking what we're doing, to, to, you know, to, to, our, to our Mother Earth. It, it's so insane. And what we're putting forward is, um, you know, sanity, it's common sense. And yet we're the ones traditionally who've been called the extremists, the radicals. Uh, it, 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 we are a strange species in many senses, but uh, I think finally that we are getting there, we're making a headway and people are realizing that we have to change and we will change. I thought, by the way, Dale, in Manifesto at the end of the book, thought some of the figures that you put there were, were really inspiring because I think a lot of people, like the British public, when you talk about things like renewable energy, there's still the view that it's quite, it's very small scale. But I think, is it 30% already? Is that the right It's, it's, it's nearly 50 now. Wow. It's nearly wow. 50 which is incredible for electricity, not gas, because we just yeah. haven't done anything with gas yet. But, you know, when I started in the mid nineties, it was, it was nothing, None, mm -hmm. you know, wind and sun, uh, that the modern renewables, there was nothing. Uh, so uh, it's come a long way in 25 years, wheels back. Yeah. Tons and tons and tons of questions. <laughs> Thank you everybody. And don't forget, if you're watching tonight, you can switch to Ecotricity for your uh, renewable gas and electro renewable electricity and carbon neutral gas. And we will actually support Viva, which is a really cool thing that we do. So we will donate up to £60 to Viva if you switch your energy to Ecotricity. So if you're a Viva supporter watching tonight and you fancy the idea of renewable energy, uh, you can go to ecotricity.co.uk forward slash fever that's a place to go um james peacock says could you both give us your views on when society will accept the role and responsibility of animal agriculture in causing human disease outbreaks such as mers sars bird flu swine flu covid bovine tb and many more thanks to you both great work Oh. I think we, we already know it, don't we? I mean, the evidence is there. It's crazy. So I'm not quite sure uh, what, what you mean by when we will accept it. When perhaps when will the majority of people accept it, I think must be the question. And, and you know, we just have to get the information out there. People are still, they look at you a little bit like, yeah, did you really just say that? Uh, you know, if you, when you tell people this, but the, these are scientific facts. So, uh, you know, but we're in the minority, I guess, for now. Yeah, we did um, last year. Um, at the start of the main lockdown, I spent a lot of time um, researching coronavirus and we did a campaign called Three and Four. Um, and of course, it was a shock to a lot of people that Three and Four zoonotic diseases, so they're diseases that pass from animals to people, um, um, the new infectious diseases are zoonotic. So actually, you know, some of the rubbish that's been spoken about COVID in terms of, you know, you know, could a pandemic actually happen? You know, was it somebody's invention kind of thing and deliberate and all the rest of it? And what what they're ignoring is the fact that zoonotic diseases happen all the time. So that guy that just mentioned MERS and SARS and but there's loads of other diseases. AIDS was a zoonotic disease. Ebola was a zoonotic disease. And they're, they're emerging with great about two or three, two to four, actually, wildlife biologists were saying the other day new diseases every year and what I found you know really quite worrying was when I researched factory farming itself and its role because obviously coronavirus we think was passed from bat to pangolin who were traded in these dreadful places and people have been eating pangolins um, in China for, for many years um, but in the you know let's look at the rest of the world we factory farm all over the world and when you look at um, something like bird flu um, especially something like H5N1. So that's already jumped across to human beings almost a thousand times across the world. Um, I mean, a thousand separate times across the world. And when it does jump across, it's incredibly deadly. So it's killed over half the people that it's infected, including children. 
So this is not a disease that's, you know, um, more deadly for the elderly. This is a disease that is going to affect young people, teenagers, people in their 20s, and it will kill. And when I looked at the actual number of strains that had gone right across Asia already, directly due to factory farming, mainly of, um, again, chickens um, and pigs, of course, you, you know, something like 40 different strains of that H5N1 virus already exist directly due to intensive farming. So that's why I was saying before, end factory farming before it ends us, because we really literally are putting the human race at huge risk of a pandemic way worse than coronavirus way 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 worse in terms of mortality rates and 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 the um the demographic of people that it's that it's going to kill and so you know have we not got the intelligence the wisdom to actually wake up to this and actually say no we actually demand now that factory farming goes um and in fact um uh, one of the patrons of Viva is Michael Mansfield QC and he's looking at a legal way of trying to call the UK government to account on this and there are, there are many ways of looking at this we're campaigning on it we're doing something you know obviously we're calling on boris johnson to end factory farming and many people around the world are now calling on their governments and we're looking at ways of cooperating with different countries but ultimately it does need ordinary so-called ordinary extraordinary if you want to call us folks just changing ourselves because as we change ourselves and we go into that supermarket as i said and we do not buy factory farm meat or any animal product we are pushing and driving that change which is why you've got supermarkets falling over themselves now to say we're doing the best for vegans you know you've got sainsbury's saying one quarter is going to be vegetarian or vegan in four years time you know, you've got waitrose have said already almost 10 million people are either vegetarian or vegan in the uk and the reason they're so interested in us by the way is because they know we're driving the change for the rest of the uk in other words we're driving this meat reduction the so-called flexitarianism um, because we're pushing the issues out there all the time and we just won't shut up and so and so we're educating people all the time it is frustratingly slow um and i wish you know a billionaire would come along and say here you go viva make tv ads and actually swamp the media with all this and if that happens you know if anyone's listening to this who wants to fund that then we will happily go ahead and swamp the world with our message <laughs> Say, sounds great loads of questions coming in i can't forget <laughs> I must forget, I forgot to ask Juliet how long we've got you for this evening because we've got tons of questions here and uh, we might not get through them all tonight. Um, I'm gonna do some, these are going to be some quick fire ones we're going to do now. So short answers to these ones. Martin asks, what are both of your favourite healthy meals and your favourite naughty unhealthy meals? <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, Dale, go first. <laughs> uh, I, I'm a big fan of chips, as it happens, and I kind of think they're healthy as well as naughty. So, you know, <laughs> I, I might just say chips. But I'm also a fan of burgers, particularly the um, plant devil burger that Forest Green makes or Devil's Kitchen makes. Um, and so burger and chips is even better. <laughs> but, but, I but I love vegetables as well, you know, all kinds of vegetables. I'm really easy to feed. Um, that's what I think, anyway. Yeah, I mean, I this is going to sound, you know, I mean, God, I'm a, a big foodie and I, I enjoy my food, I really do. Um, at the moment, I'm kind of getting into a lot of Italian dishes um, and I'm doing, this is going to sound boring, but it's not, I do loads of salads, but with mango and pears and walnuts and all kinds of stuff going on in there. I really enjoy that. My naughty sort of stuff, I don't know. Um, my no feeling naughty would be like having a glass of wine in a hot tub run by Ecotricity Energy. <laughs> <laughs> don't say too bad. Here's a nice one for you both. What are you both most proud of in your now lengthy careers? Oh, whoa. I'm not mm. proud of anything. So that's easy <laughs> for me to say. I'm not proud of anything. I'm absolutely not. It's, uh, that is a really difficult question to answer. Um, I suppose the most poignant work that I do at Viva has been the investigations and being able to get that out in the public eye and then see the transformation of so many thousands of people. I don't think, like again, I don't think pride's the right word. It's um, it's a fulfilment, I suppose, of achieving what you know what you set out to do. Um, which I guess is, yeah, like Dale says, it's not really the right word. I do, I do though feel proud, proud of my team. You know, when they do things like, um, 
when I first gone into a factory farm and investigated and decided that it's worth getting hidden cameras in there and they've literally done things like have to climb over roofs to avoid the um, the alarms going off. I feel pretty proud of them, I must say. Here's one for you. I never even knew this existed. I'm learning something. Uh, Martin says, I love hemp milk. What about you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a fan. And uh, just, I just saw somebody saying, surely I'm proud of my team. I am. So there you go, Steve. Just, <laughs> just to answer that one. But look, I, I, I'm not a fan of hemp milk. I'm a fan of hemp as a product. I think it's got an awful lot to offer. Um, but I only really drink milk in coffee, and I, I'm a fan of oat milk. I'm not a fan of hemp milk either. Um, oops, sorry, but uh, <laughs> uh, soy milk and oat milk. Got you. Uh, we get asked all sorts of stuff here. This is a random one. Dale, is the timber you're going to use for your new stadium grown in the UK? Uh, I don't know. You know, we've not chosen it. Uh, so I don't know where it's going to come from. We, we'll try to make it, of course, lowest footprint that we possibly can. But that will be a balance of factors. If we can get it from the UK and everything else is equal, then we'll do that. Uh, but at the moment, we are nowhere near procuring wood for that. We're a couple of years away, probably, from having to get serious about that. Well, and here's another one for you. This is from uh, from Jamie. How would how would you persuade somebody to at least consider going vegan? It depends. I mean, we do that all the time. Obviously, it depends on the individual. If there was the magic bullet, we would have used it. And everybody has different motivations, and there are different. I call it a road of compassion and at one end there's somebody who's consuming everything and doesn't care about anything or at least they don't think they do through to the other end of the spectrum and everybody's along that road somewhere so it depends where they are um i found with young people in a nutshell it's animal cruelty that motivates them to change and change very quickly indeed um environmental issues are coming up behind that but it's still animal cruelty that seems to motivate teenagers um as people go older then other issues come into the fore so you know we've changed an awful lot of people through health issues i don't care which issues that they change as long as we change them so we use environmental animal and health as the as the three main um drivers for change yeah and um you know i agree that they're all there available and for me they happened in the order of uh, animals first that was what i was aware of as a kid the climate in the 90s and then this increasing uh, human health uh, impact that uh, you know the scientific evidence has been emerging of since then um, my own view is that more people are going vegan now or um, reducing their meat intake for their own personal health. That's just my own view. Um, I think it's, a, um, it's certainly something we're trying to do through the Express campaign as well, which is to communicate green issues in a different way, um, to, to talk to people about how it impacts them. And I think veganism is a great example because it, you, know, you just live a healthier, longer life if you don't eat animals. And I think that resonates with more people than than anything else just my view have either of you heard of precision fermentation it's supposed to be able to replace dairy in a decade it will be it will outprice dairy too we, we we've already got a replacement for dairy it's called oat milk soya milk plant milk you know i, I think it's done the job's done i don't know what pre precision fermentation actually is but it sounds very interesting <laughs> Here's one for you, uh, and uh, I've got some heavier ones to get back into in um, in a second. Uh, and this one says, uh, I've just promised not a heavy one, and all the ones I seem to have here are heavy. Oh, there we go. Um, surely, Georgina says, surely we should now be aggressively targeting the dairy industry, as there are so many dairy alternatives already available. Why aren't more people switching more quickly? I think they, you know, in terms of, it depends how quickly you expect things to change. In terms of the history of our culture in Britain, things are changing incredibly rapidly. Um, if you look at the sales of um, dairy alternative milks, um, it's something like one in four households now regularly buy plant, plant milks instead of dairy. Um, and it, it has changed very, very quickly and still is. Um, we do do big anti-dairy campaigns. In 2018, we launched Scary Dairy. Well, that was actually filming on dairy farms and showed, a, a, a just, we just happened to film on a, a major farm that's um, a global player where a, a cow was giving birth. Um, 
you know, we could show what happened to that calf because, of course, the male calves um, in the dairy industry go off as so-called trash. We put billboards on major places like the M6 and in London, um, pointing out that 90,000 calves that year were going to be shot in the head as unwanted byproducts. And the reason that we do things like that is because it, people really sit up and take notice because they still, A, don't really know that cows give birth to calves and that's what makes them give milk, as we were saying before, but also what happens to those calves. And also you have to remember that the dairy cows themselves, although they'd naturally live till around around 20, although I've known rescue considerably longer, they're regularly killed at around five to six years old because they're so knackered. Um, and so they're going into the meat chain. So there's, a, there's an, a, you know, a complete and um, intimate connection between the dairy and the meat industries. So it's making people aware of those things and the damage that those industries are doing to the environment are absolutely colossal um, in terms of creation of greenhouse gases and, and especially in terms of loss of wildlife so if you care about you know um like so many people like to say that they do they care about wildlife then the answer is to go vegan because to be honest you have to if you, if you truly care about wildlife because of the loss of the wildernesses that are being driven first and foremost by dairy and beef Here's one for you both. This is from Jane. Um, actually, before I take Jane's question, uh, is it okay if we go for another 15 minutes? Can we go to 8.45? Would that be okay for you both? Because we've got tons of questions. Uh, is that I okay? I can manage. Yeah, that's fine. Excellent. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I think my camera's about to pack up in a second because it's overheating. There you go. My camera's Ooh. stopped working. There you go. Um, so, uh, Jane has asked, what impact is Brexit having on the pig trade to Europe? Is it having a further detrimental impact on British pig welfare? Um, I, don't, I don't think it's particularly having a further impact on British uh, pig welfare. That, that is simply because the vast majority of pigs in Britain are indoor raised. And so the conditions really for a lot of them could not be any worse. And, uh, you know, I'm not exaggerating. In terms of the mega farms that exist across the UK, um they give the pigs as little as is possible to keep an animal alive until the five six months old when they're slaughtered um and the breeding cells are kept in atrocious conditions so um i wouldn't say it was worse i'd just say it's as bad i i imagine live animal uh, transport is very difficult now because of brexit and certainly have seen that uh, Brexit has been good for shellfish, not the shellfish industry, but shellfish themselves, because uh, the, you know the stuff can't be exported, and, and Brexit has just had a massive negative impact on the fishing industry in Britain, which is good for fish. So you know, I'm I'm happy for that. But uh, Brexit, wow, there's a whole other topic there. I think we should not go there, Will. <laughs> Let's not go there tonight, and my camera will probably explode again in a few short seconds. <laughs> uh, here's another one for you both, uh, and this is uh, from Zoe. How do you feel about the baby formula industry, Nestle, etc.? Their marketing practices in the development world uh, are resulting in the deaths of many babies. I think um, major players like Nestle have got a terrible record um, in terms of... Um, that, that how they've treated their workers in terms of how they've run campaigns that's just been mentioned um yeah um in terms of personally me as an individual I, i'm not somebody who likes supporting companies like nestle um when i think there are all kinds of um, smaller companies that are much more moral if you like that you can support um, having said that, from a pragmatic point of view of them launching vegan products, which maybe the the, the questioner is perhaps hinting at, um, then obviously, again, from a pragmatic point of view, the more these gigantic companies can invest in vegan products instead of non-vegan products, then that helps the world change, basically. And that's a good thing. Here's one from Tim, and Tim says, what are you, both of your views on veganism in education? Should the truth of the industry and the meat industry be taught from a young age? And should we have vegan school meals? We cannot get them in my daughter's school. Well, I think that's shocking, actually, that you can't get them in your daughter's school. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm just a big fan of, of honesty and the truth. You know, uh, my youngest son is 12, nearly 13, 
And, uh, you know, he's had these conversations with his mates at school and they're all like, nah, come on, that can't be real. You know, that's not what that is. You know, to kids, uh, meat products are, you know, just presented as uh, something completely detached from the animals that they came from. And, and I don't think it's wrong to just to let kids know, uh, you know, what beef is, what pork is. And, uh, you know, without having to go into the details of factory farming, at least uh, say what it is. You know, it's, it's a dead animal. My view is if you if farming is so abhorrent that you actually can't tell our own children, then there has to be something fundamentally very wrong with the system indeed, if you're that ashamed of it. And it's even, you know, um, um, a subject to debate. Um, of course, farming and the way all foods are produced should be absolutely, it should be totally open and we should talk about it absolutely openly. And children should know from a young age that animals have to be killed um you know to to, to to get onto their plate yeah we should be absolutely honest and open about it and as they get older um then they should be shown what happens inside factory farms and when they get older still um they should be shown what happens inside a slaughterhouse because that is the truth um in terms of vegan meals and um, i can remember pre-viva working on a campaign to get vegetarian meals in schools and um, which was called choice and we did. We, we got the vast majority of secondary schools to do it in a very short space of time with vegan meals. Of course, since those times, um, provision of meals is, was all privatised. So it was a harder campaign to run. But I have to say, an awful lot of secondary schools now do provide vegan school meals. So I'm surprised that the person saying that their children can't get it. I have said with primary schools, if the person um, who said that wants to contact me privately, we do have examples of schools that got really good primary school vegan menus that, and we will write to the head teacher of the school. Um, um, so if you want to contact me privately, we will do that for you. Amazing. Um, here's one from Orla. You're such an animal lover. You want to eventually make cattle extinct. This is in capitals with lots of... <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. It had to happen. I believe, yes, we love things, I believe, yes, things need to be diluted down in terms of mass production and mistreatment of animals. But, quote from Dale, less animals bred each year until there are none. That was a shocking comment coming from him, and I'm hoping I misunderstood him. No, I meant I meant that, um, but I don't mean no animals. Obviously, I mean no farmed animals, um, because you know we don't need to do it. I mean, if somebody wants to breed a cow and keep a cow as a pet, you know, I'm all for it. But, but that's that's not what I meant. I meant no farmed animals. Absolutely. The thing is, we get asked this all the time, and in fact, the point is, surely the vast majority of animals, so over a billion are killed in the UK, the vast majority of those are intensively farmed and most of those are boring the chickens. So those are the chickens kept for meat. Even if you rescue those animals of which, you know, um, you know, I have been involved with and with sanctuaries that have tried to keep them alive, it is incredibly hard to keep those poor little creatures alive because of the way they've been genetically manipulated. These animals are slaughtered at six weeks old. So you have to ask yourselves, what the hell have we done as the human race to these animals to actually make them not be able to survive, even if you give them the best of the best? Surely our energies globally should go into rewilding the world, enabling wildlife to exist and encouraging the wild ancestors of farmed animals, which, of course, still exist around the world. So the wild ancestor of the broiler chicken, of course, is the jungle fowl. And I've been lucky enough in places like India to see the jungle fowl in all their glory in the rainforests. These are the animals that we should be protecting, not these poor little genetic monstrosities that can't actually exist without human interference. The same with turkeys. The breasts have been grown because they've been genetically manipulated so they cannot even breed naturally you know they are literally you know i don't know if i should say this but the males are wanked off to actually get the sperm from them to put into the females to create new turkeys i mean that is just so sick you know but wild turkeys exist in many countries across the world we should ensure that their wild habitats are preserved so that wild turkeys can still exist and live in the woodlands that they are native to the same with pigs as we all know, wild boar are the ancestor of um, pigs. They're very closely related. So you, so you ensure that the woodlands exist for those animals to exist. In Britain, the only um, genuinely wild cattle in the whole of Britain are the white cattle of Chillingham, um, which are in the north of England. And they've been in the, in the park for many hundreds of years. Um, and there are species that are quite wild of cattle in different countries of the world. Again, 
you enable those animals to exist with um, the native wildlife. We do not need to artificially breed any farmed animals for our whim, remembering that all of those animals are killed as babies. Um, they're just slaughtered, for, you know, for us to consume. What we should be doing is preserving, as I say, their wild ancestors. Um, I've just checked with Facebook. It's okay for you to say wanking off. That's absolutely fine. Um, Claire O'Neill says, can we have three roaming cows? If so, where are they going to live? Well, the wild cattle of Chillingham live in um, a, a park which is hundreds of acres, which is um, basically this incredible area that um, they encourage native wildlife to exist. And these animals have um, coexisted with wildlife for, as I say, they've not been touched for 800 years. Um, so, so with the freeing up of um, land through getting rid of animal agriculture, because as Dale mentioned earlier, the vast majority of um, land in the UK that's used for farming is used for animal agriculture. Um, much of the arable crops are used to grow fodder to feed animals. So much land is going to be freed up that we will be able to rewild. Easily. I'm not sure if we lost Will there because he cut out mid question. So uh, I wonder if his camera died. Oh, he's back. Modern technology. Unfortunately, I'm still here. We're here for five minutes more. So if you've got a question, get it in now. Uh, here's a new, here's one from uh, Tim. And Tim says, uh, I'm new to the world of Viva. Can I donate monthly? You certainly can. Thank you very much. Uh, if you go to viva.org.uk, forward slash donate there's a direct debit um form to do thank you very much much appreciated excellent um and um i reckon unless anything incredible comes in in the next couple of minutes this is going to be the final question from me and then i'll leave you guys both to to wrap this up but thank you everybody for so many questions loads and loads of brilliant ones um having the government and unexpected unexpected alliances in the world of green is great however Taking HS2 as an example, how can we prevent the same destructive development of the past being pushed through by claiming it's green development for the fight against climate change? And she says, wonderful work you're both doing, by the way. That's fab. Thanks for that. Look, I don't know how we stop another HS2. Obviously, we didn't know how to stop this one. Um, and. And, you know, I, I don't feel that we're yet working with government on this green agenda. We're definitely working with the Express and Express readership, and they have the ear of government. That's that's also clear. And maybe we'll see some influence soon. I mean, the budget's just around the corner, and we've written to Rishi about VAT and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, the editor of the Express tells me that Number 10 are interested in the campaign. They're taking note, which is what happens. You know, right-wing tabloids do influence governments. Um, so fingers crossed, but I don't think we're yet working with government and I don't have the answer to prevent the next HS2, except, you know, perhaps maybe the experience of this first one will be so bad that nobody will try it again. Um, my experience in terms of political lobbying is that it, like I said before, it's frustratingly slow, um, which is why it was something I personally couldn't do. I had to um, set up a, a campaigning organisation that worked with the public. Um, so my, my view is, and having looked at other sort of, I suppose, revolutionary movements, if you like, um, is that basically that it's the public that drive the change. And now industry is responding to that public change um, in the widest possible sense. And from that, the spin off, if you like, is going to be governmental change. Um, it is inevitable. But as Dale says, we've still got a long way to go. Um, it will happen. Good one. So uh, that being the last question, maybe Will's not going to reappear. And so it uh, it's just left me to thank you, Juliet, for joining me tonight in this chat. I mean, it's been it's been fab. We don't meet very often at all, probably not often enough to kind of chat about stuff. So I've like, really enjoyed it. Just want to thank you for coming along and thank everybody that's been watching and, um, and uh, say goodbye to everybody. Thank you for inviting me on. And uh, again, I really enjoyed your book. So, I, I am going to Thanks, pop Julia. back in and say, Julia, could you He's tell back. people where to find um, Viva? How you find you on? How you find you guys online? Oh, thank you. It's viva.org.uk, and everything is there. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> cool. All right. Thanks again, Julia, and thanks everybody for tuning in. And uh, see you all on the next one. And keep up the good work, Julia. Thank you. Keep up you the fab too. work. Thank you. <laughs>